Welcome to The Trader, a traitor's podcast. My name's Matthew and I'm a writer working in TV development and I am a 100% faithful, not a traitor. That's the reverse of a callback and its significance will become apparent later in the episode. The Trader is a deep dive into every episode of the hit TV competition series, The Traitors. And this is season three of the podcast, which is dedicated to the Australian version of The Traitors. I started episode one with my guest co-host Lindsay Chisholm, and I have another returning co-host for this episode. But before we meet them, it's time for some exciting Traitors updates in TT News. Huge UK news in the past week, the Traitors won two BAFTAs on Sunday the 14th of May. The programme won in the category of Reality and Constructed Factual, as well as Entertainment Performance, which was awarded to host Claudia Winkleman, who looked overwhelmed and ecstatic to win. She thanked Studio Lambert in her acceptance speech, saying they were extraordinary, and even Claudia's outfit had a nod to the programme with the word faithful adorning the back of her blazer. On the downside, the Traitors USA did not win, sadly, in its MTV Awards category, losing out to, as I predicted in the previous episode, RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. Apologies for this next one, because I am about to cite the Sun newspaper as a source, but I have no choice. The quote-unquote news publication reports that the traitor's boss teases exciting details about totally different series too. In the article, producer Mike Cotton is quoted as saying, It's going to be totally different for series two, like all good murder mysteries. Everybody knows how to play the game now. We'll have to turn it on its head. There are always twists and turns of the game. There will be new twists and turns. There's so much more we can do with it. The article also claims that Claudia Winkleman initially suggested the producer shouldn't make another series. She's quoted as saying, I suggested to the producers to leave it there. It's quite nice to walk away and be done. To which they replied, are you ill? She also said, I can't wait to go back to the castle to watch people play the greatest game on television. I'm knitting a high funnel sweater immediately. I can't wait to see Claudia's wardrobe choices later this year. And I'm also slightly sceptical about those producer comments. Yes, I'm sure they'll include new missions and a couple of new elements or slight rule changes, but with such a winning formula, there's no way they'll risk success and fundamentally mess with the essential elements of the programme. And finally, some Aussie news. The Traitors Australia team has released a promo shot of returning host Roger Corser alongside the new cast for season two. The Instagram caption reads, Introducing the cunning contestants checking into the ultimate game of deception. And states that the new season of Traitors Australia is coming soon to 10 and 10 play, with no specific date yet. Although I imagine it must be within the next three months if they're releasing cast pictures already. Interestingly, there are various familiar faces here. Well, probably more familiar to Australian viewers. This time around, the contestants will include famous people and previous reality show contestants like Hannah Ferrier from Below Deck Mediterranean, TV host Ash Pollard, pro wrestler Princess Ozzy, real name Simone Williams, Australian Survivor star Luke Toki, and very interestingly, Guyton Grantley from TV show Underbelly, which also starred Roger Corser himself. Could this be a conflict of interest? Some social media comments already seem to think so. I'll keep you updated on release dates as soon as we know more. A lot of news this episode, and I spoke even more to my co-host today about that season two announcement. So let's go ahead and meet him. My guest on this episode of The Trader is Joseph Usher. Joseph has hosted a previous episode with me as a huge Traitors fan, potentially a future podcaster, 
and knows everything there is to know about X-Men, which he posts about on Instagram. Joseph, welcome back to The Trader. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks for having me again. I'm very good, thank you, in this lovely weather. And yeah, I'm looking forward to being on this podcast again and covering Australia. Yes, I'm very glad to have you because you've watched the Australia Traitors. In fact, you possibly watched it before I did. I'm not sure. Um, without spoilers for the rest of the mm-hmm. season, of what do you think in general what, about about the Traitors Australia? Um, FYI, I know it's a show when it was all produced, but I found half the class massively unlikable. <laughs> I want maybe seven or six of them. And it was probably to me, I think this is the most brutal and probably best way in tasks. And again, I do hope UK and US bring elements of this over because a lot of the Australian does it a lot better. Yeah, I agree actually about the tasks, the missions. I think they're on kind of a bigger scale in Australia, which I really like. And yes, I think there's some really brutal stuff that happens in this season which is amazing to watch so we are going to talk about episode two today which considering it's so early in the series is such a great episode with some really shocking moments so it's it's brilliant that we get that so early on Uh, before we get into it though we are going to play our game on the podcast the trader traitor Our goal throughout this episode from here on in is to tell one lie to one another. The lie has to be a fabrication or a made-up fact, big or small, about the traitors or about yourself or about something else. It can't be a fake opinion, like saying you don't believe in Chloe's psychic abilities and then later you say, actually, I do believe in them. At the end of the episode, we each have to put our traitor hunting skills to the test and decide what we thought the other person's lie was. Joseph, are you ready to tell me a lie at some point? Yes, I am. I just okay. Like Excellent. That's what I like to hear. So I think we're ready to go for it and start talking all yeah. about episode two of The Traitors Australia. So we start off episode two with a little bit of a recap of the first episode. So some important points we need to remember were that Jack was banished in the first banishment room as a result of this story that Olivia told. And we'll probably we'll probably end up talking about this in a little while. And the recap also reminds us that the traitors were deciding about who they wanted to murder. And it, and it came down to either Sandra or Chloe. And at breakfast, that's what we are about to find out. So, breakfast. Uh, Teresa is first. Teresa is very excited about breakfast. Teresa is very energetic. Uh, (laughs) Joseph, what do you think about Teresa? Love Teresa. She's one of my favourites. She's my type of girl with food. And she kind of has, um, like no ask given energy she just feels like she's happy to be there and not overthink anything which i actually think makes her one of the most standouts yeah i think so too she seems like she's just always very appreciative to be part of this this tv program and she's loving the game so i mean she gets really into the game but i don't think she ever takes it too seriously that she gets personally upset about it so she's she's good fun to watch and also Roger's there, so a friend. She him very <laughs> she, she does. I'm there with Teresa. Uh, Mark is at breakfast as well, and he points out that, you know, already we're only in episode two and three faithfuls. They're basically three faithfuls down already. We've had a murder, we've had a banishment, and overnight oh, another faithful has been killed that they're about to find out about. We've then got this sort of uh, like cut scene to, to Mark's background. We find out a little bit more about him. So he's a legal professional. Another one. There's so many of them who work in the legal Hello. profession. That makes me wonder, like, where did they recruit this cast? Did they just advertise in some sort of like legal journal or like some sort of solicitor's <laughs> website? It's really strange. 
Um, and he says that he can tell when someone's lying because this is this is part of his job. So he's really good at this sort of thing. And he says that he has eyes on Claire. He thinks that she's been acting very strange since that first night. Now, as viewers, that makes sense to us because we know that Claire is a traitor. And Mark and some of the others, they they've picked up on that. I mean, did you do you can you see it? Do you did you notice that Claire was acting differently? Yeah, she's a bundle of nerves. And th- again, I do like Claire, so I'm very upset that he picked her up. Because the one thing I like about this is they just go in. There's yeah. no put it on the rounds. It's literally I think and I think for Claire's credit, she kept as good as a cool as she could in that environment. Um, but yeah, he's almost like the Maddie of the Australian version. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, Mark Marple, we should start calling him Detective Mark. Uh, we also have uh, Olivia who arrives at breakfast. So we get this flashback to, to I don't know what to call it, Jack Gate, Olivia Gate, Olivia versus Jack. We've got this flashback. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Cargate. Uh, so what happened in episode one was that Olivia claimed that after the mission and they were getting back in the cars, Jack put his arm around her and said something like, so who are we going to murder tonight? Or words to that effect. And this became a huge issue at the, in the banishment room last night, and it resulted in Jack being banished because, it, according to Olivia, he acted as if he was a traitor and he was conspiring to murder someone. Of course, Jack wasn't a traitor, so it made Olivia's story seem really, really strange. Uh, so Olivia now thinks she's got a target on her back because of all this, and... Well, yes, she does have a target on her back. Uh, what do, what do you think happened there, Joseph? What was going oh, on with this story? Uh, see, it's interesting with Jack because when he did the challenge and he was describing it, he was going to know the Harry Potter thing. And yeah. it's like, everyone's like, no. And I'm like, I did wonder, was he just, because he was a chess master, I wondered if his social skills aren't as clues in as everyone else. And mm. he just thought, I'll try and make this jokey not realising that everyone is on edge and paranoid as it is, especially with this cast. And I maybe think with Olivia, could she have maybe misinterpreted it? Is there something we haven't seen in this desert at all that has been put out? So I keep that in mind. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I mean, again, I don't think she means it in an ill, because again, she's another one I actually find quite likeable, but it's the whole thou process far too much, and I feel this runs through this episode massively, but no, I think she's just trying, but again, she's given nervous energy off the time as well. Yeah. And to me, she also looks double of clear, so I keep getting the right back the I don't think she means any harm. I just think she's maybe got the wrong end of the stick, but then I don't know what the other. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think the same thing. I, I, I don't think she's made up the story. I think she just misheard him. He was either kidding on... Or he said something different, she's misinterpreted it, and it's totally snowballed, and it becomes, like you said, this really important thing. And again, you know, no spoilers, but even beyond this Not episode, yet. it remains this this big <laughs> issue, all from something that she overheard and probably misheard. That's what I think. Um, Teresa at breakfast tells Claire she doesn't believe she works in a supermarket, why everyone keeps saying this all the time? A, why do they think this? And B, why do they care? It's this this weird thing that keeps coming up all the time. Um, I, I don't know why it's a, a thing. I, I really don't know. Um, Fee arrives at, at breakfast and Fee is so extra. I really love Fee because I think she's such great TV. Um, she has a big personality and she knows it. She says she thinks that her big personality will save her. Um, sometimes that doesn't work in the traitors. I think sometimes in the traitors, actually having a really big personality draws attention to you and either gets you banished or murdered. So she's going to have to be careful. And she's bonded with Ethan very and Teresa very early on. They, they've become really good pals. Um, Ethan and Middy are very sus about MK, understandably. And of course at breakfast... 
MK does another speech. What? Oh. <laughs> what? I've just, my notes just say in big giant capital letters, why? Why does he keep doing this? And what What do you think about MK? Cringe in the light. <laughs> From the minute I've seen him, I didn't like him. These speeches, like, it's almost like if you want to play the game and get made at all punished, feel yeah. free to do what he's doing. Note to people once to go in, don't do this because it does make you likable. It probably will make everyone anxious and on edge. And it just feels very like he's selling his job or something. Like he's trying to represent the club. It's just weird. And I was, I loved how everyone just looked nervous and I was cringing. I thought if I was then, I just want to run the room. But I don't think it will happen. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh... We'll probably talk a bit about MK more later, but yeah, it's just so uncomfortable. Um, after most people arrive, we're left with either Chloe or Sandra to come in at breakfast, which we knew because they were the two people that the traitors were discussing for murder last night. And eventually it is Chloe who arrives and Sandra has been murdered. And everyone's really shocked by this. I, as a viewer, I was quite surprised because Sandra really seemed like very confident and she seemed like she was getting a lot of editorial time so she featured quite heavily in episode one and now she's gone already uh and clay we then we then have a little segment where claire as a traitor explains why they chose to murder sandra and basically says sandra was just too too clever she was too confident she had a very good chance of catching on to the traitors so the traitors don't want that they need to get rid of people that they think are going to figure them out. So Sandra's gone. Uh, Roger then arrives and he gives them a little bit of a clue about what they're going to be doing today. He says uh, their mission will be a chance to get things back on track or let them run even further off the rails. So it's kind of obvious. It's something to do with a train, train tracks, something like that. <laughs> and Chloe, Chloe the clairvoyant, oh. speaks up <laughs> and says that her great uncle came to her in a dream last night and told her to jump on the train. Interesting. Um, but then Middy says, well, you know, last night's banishment kind of told us that we shouldn't really listen to Chloe because last night at the banishment... <laughs> Chloe said that her spirit advisors told her that Jack was the traitor and they should vote for him. And Jack was not the traitor at all. Uh, and actually, as they get into the cars to head to the mission then, everyone's discussing Chloe. They say things like, you know, no one's really that close to her. Her predictions seem quite vague and inaccurate. And Angus asks, well, what's going to happen when she starts accusing people? Uh, maybe Angus is being a little bit psychic there. Hmm. And... Nigel's actually sitting with Chloe in the car and he says to her, well, who, who, who do you suspect right now? <laughs> she just turns to him and says, um, you. Uh, now, what, do you what do you think about Chloe? Right. Don't massively do not like. <laughs> I just don't. She wound me up from the minute I thought. And I think in this episode, I think she was so trying. It's it's a very hard one because, again, you're in this environment. She's the, the Jack thing was just cringe because she might as well have just said all nine people spoke to her about it. <laughs> but it makes good TV, I suppose, so I can understand. But she has this weird, like, either understand me or don't bother at all to want to get. But what I found interesting, and I wondered if you picked it up, when she asked Nigel in the car, it completely cost him. There was no reference to that scene ever again. Yeah. there's, And that really made me question, what the hell? Because I was like, where's this next scene? Because it just jumped. And I was like, so I, again, I'll discuss it in a bit. But it, it was just weird. And I don't really, again, the train thing, the East Ed's on the rails. So you think train track. I don't believe a great uncle went to see, but again, that's a belief, so I understand that. But I thought it was just I roll one really to get. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the editing because that I this is something that I noticed throughout the season, and I and I love the mm -hmm. I love the season, but there are often strange editing choices where you get someone says something 
really significant or curious and then we just cut away from it and we don't find out what the response was so that's something that will come up in other episodes um as for chloe i i've tried to several of the contestants um are going to come on the podcast um for interviews which is really exciting i've tried to track chloe down i can't really find her on social media uh except that she does psychic she does readings on tiktok as a lot of people do uh but i the I don't use TikTok that much, but I don't think you can. You can't DM people on TikTok. You can't get in touch there. I don't so, believe, so I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to have if I want to get Chloe, I'm going to have to contact the spirit world and get my advisors to speak to her through her great uncle yeah. or something like that. Um, so we arrive at the mission then, uh, and Roger emerges through steam on the platform in slow motion, looking very, very handsome and dashing. Uh, and there's just this hilarious close up on Kate, just like staring, staring at Roger. She was this is probably taken totally out of context. She was probably looking at something completely different. But I, to be honest, if I was there, I'd be staring at Roger as well. Um, oh, P.S. The tracksuits are back. The red, uh, the tracksuits that they wear for all their missions, which just uh, really make me I laugh. Like sponsorship. <laughs> uh, Roger tells them that there is $24,000 up for grabs and unlike most challenges this is an all or nothing challenge they can't win some of that money they're either going to win it all or they're not going to win anything uh, there's my favourite moment of this whole episode which I laughed so much at is ter- they've got a little interview of Teresa and she mm-hmm. says six <laughs> She says, so far, it must be from the first mission, they've only got six silver bars. She says, six silver bars isn't enough. I just feel like I'm disappointing Roger, and I really like Roger. I don't want to disappoint Daddy. And no, I wrote that in a minute. <laughs> I had to keep watching this over and over because it made me laugh so much. So, Teresa is good fun. Uh, Roger explains that what they have to do is stop the train before the end of the track. And Fee looks legitimately panicked. Like she thinks it's real and the train is actually going to like dive off a cliff or something if they don't stop it. And then, of course, Chloe has another vision. Chloe has this vision about who should go on what carriage. And her vision tells her that they will win the $24,000, which is quite funny in retrospect. Uh, Dirk is really not convinced by Chloe's abilities and Matt, they, they kind of just ignore Chloe because Matt takes over a little bit um, because they probably need someone to take charge, there are a lot of them so he just takes control and says look, you go in this group, you go in this group we'll have a leader for each group uh, and Chloe's vision uh, just sort of gets ignored by everybody which is possibly quite wise the, the mission is basically, it's like, a, it's like a moving escape room, isn't it? Um, they have yeah. different teams and different carriages, and each team in each carriage has a puzzle to solve, but they have to do it in order. So carriage one has to solve their problem before they can pass on the answer to carriage two. So the way it works is, in carriage one, they have to find a passenger name in a huge manifest. Someone doesn't know what a, a passenger manifest is, which is a wee bit funny, but you know what? If you don't know, you don't know. Once they found the name, then carriage two, they have to find a passenger number in a big pile of hundreds of tickets, which leads them to a specific seat number. And they pass that on to carriage three, and carriage three have to do this mental arithmetic task. They have to multiply and add seat numbers together. Craig's the one who's pretty good at this. So he works it out. But they only then have about three minutes left, so they're really struggling for time. And in carriage four, they have to use carriage three's number, which is 135, to unlock a case. And there are about 40 cases kicking about in this carriage. And and they then find the key to the final room in the train, where the brake is, and they've got to pull the brake to stop the train. But there's this whole ring of keys. It was giving me, like, Rose and Jack and Titanic when they are yep. trying to like unlock the lift. <laughs> That's all I could think of. But sadly, unlike Rose and Jack, they run out of time. They fail the mission. Of course, like Roger's in the break room the whole time, just standing watching all this happen. Like he couldn't have just pulled the break for them. <laughs> yeah. Uh and and of course, 
Chloe claims that they would have won if oh. they'd followed her team suggestions. And she's, she also says part of her vision was that Mark should have been the one to turn the key. So maybe in like some parallel universe somewhere, Mark did turn the key and they won that money. But I, but Chloe, Chloe then suggests that this was sabotage. She thinks the traitors were up to something, but that makes no sense. So I think, well, the traitors want the money too. So this isn't like other... I know there's other shows where you have tra- secret people who try and sabotage missions, but this show doesn't work like that. So... I don't know what Chloe's talking about. And it and it was an all or not on like thing and again, loved this trial was probably again there needs to be maybe not for the UK because we don't get much anyway, but maybe for countries where you're in them twenty grams. Maybe they're an all or not because it adds the stakes. Yeah. I mean my nerves were absolutely shot. I mean I'm really <laughs> but even I would have been panicking at that because that was tense. And I don't think with a going go in this group, that group, I'm guessing the production have times they need to hit for these missions. So she would have probably took 15 minutes alone out of everyone. So yeah. for me, it was quite clever. They ignored her, got on that train. Because did they arrive in a train in this? They came up in cars, didn't they? And the, to the house. To the yeah. house of the first episode. Yeah, they just arrive in cars. They don't use the train, yeah. So it was a nice nod to use on the train because in every other series they use the train. Yeah, yeah, so I thought that's true. It's a nice little nod to the show, but no, I am good at maths and I would have done crap at that. And yeah, my anxiety was through the roof. <laughs> I said sorry for Lewis because he was about five seconds else. I know, poor Lewis. And uh, <laughs> Lewis is such a nice player. Like he seems yeah. so pleasant. He's really sweet. Yeah, definitely. So we've we've failed our mission. Sadly, they've they didn't win any money at all. So we're back at the hotel, uh, and all the players are getting together and discussing what they're going to do tonight, who they're going to vote for, who they're suspicious of. Teresa is gutted that they lost the money. Um, MK, <laughs> our favorite, MK mentions, you know, he's he does this all the time. He says, as a criminal defense lawyer. And I think you could have like a, some sort of drinking game where every time he says that, you take a drink. And then he begins just talking himself in circles again and saying like, oh. if I was a traitor, and he, I don't know if you noticed this, Joseph, he, the way he pronounces the word traitor is so strange. He he says traitor. And once you notice it, it's, it's so awful. So if I was a traitor, and it's, it's bizarre. Um, so all the discussions are centering on MK acting so weirdly and doing these strange breakfast speeches. No one even wants to be stuck with him in a group. Like they sort of just kind of get up and leave when he comes in the room. <laughs> Except Mark. Mark's a bit different. Mark says he doesn't think it's MK. I think he knows MK is just acting very uncomfortably, but he doesn't think that MK is a traitor because M- Mark is still focused on Claire. He says she's got this nervous energy. And Teresa agrees. She says, yeah, she was white as a ghost after Roger went round the table and picked the traitors. Um, so there's yeah, not everybody's centred on MK at this point. Uh, Justine is insistent, though, that Claire is not a traitor and then goes straight to Claire to tell her, which is a really bad idea because we know that Claire is a traitor. We've then got this weird, weird scene and actually, this this reminds me of what you mentioned earlier with the strange editing. So we've got this bizarre scene in, it looks like a yoga room, and there's four of them sitting around all with their yoga mats. Um, and Marielle is kind of putting on a bit of a performance and talking to everybody. She says um, that they, they have to root out the people who are divisive and not acting in the best interests of the faithfuls as a team. And then there's this weird long take where of Chloe just not speaking and saying absolutely zero. I I I watched this again and timed it, and it's sixteen seconds of silence, like sixteen seconds of just this weird shot of Chloe just sitting looking at everyone. There probably wasn't a weird silence. I think this, they've just done this in editing. They've just like cut out the sound picked these shots of Chloe to make her look even stranger than she is 
Like, I don't think four people would have sat in a in silence for that long. I think they've just manufactured it this way. And Marielle then asks what she thinks. And Chloe says that she'll reveal her thoughts in the banishment room and that she just can't trust anyone. And then the lights flicker, which seems to be real. Like, you do notice it on camera. Yeah. Um, and Chloe says thank you because she thinks that's spirit, like, giving her some sort of message. Mm. I, I kind of think Spirit's got better things to do than help someone win a game show. <laughs> but what do I know? Um, and Chloe talks about like using her skills in the game to help her. Therese is not convinced it's a good idea for everyone to trust her because of what she claims to be able to do. Mm. Um, what, what did you think about this scene in the yoga room? So... It it was I was more shocked they had a yoga room. I think <laughs> in the environment, the last thing I just wanted to do is send me shackles. They'd be a mess and I'd probably cry snapping a shoelace in that environment. So I was a bit shocked there was a yoga room and they were all just sat there and I was like, What have they been doing? Because 'Cause they're not exactly working up sweat. Um and yeah, I think again it goes back because this whole show without spoiling was edited. Because there is a contestant that has been very not shown, and that is always in the back of my mind watching these scenes. Um, even with the whole MK thing, that was a bit like the edit seems a bit at times like we're missing massive pieces of stories. That's my opinion watching it again. Um, but yeah, it was weird. The light flicking, it was a good time. So I bet you the production were like, this is really good for us because we can just slice it in. Make uh, go more. Oh, it's the spirits. But yeah, it's weird, and it's almost like no one trusts anybody. Whereas at least in every other version, there was clicks. There isn't a divide. It does not a proper. I wouldn't say realistically does a proper click because even though I find Mark really annoying, I appreciated that he did go for MK and go. I'm. I've got your back. I know it's not you. But then I also understand and think, even if you know someone's faithful, you're still going to vote someone out that makes you uncomfortable because you're not going to want to spend this mind mess of a place and think, I want to stay with you when every day you're giving us like a sermon every morning and then <laughs> bringing your job into it, which makes me think the crime rate in Australia really bad because of them are lawyers. Um, but no, and maybe that's why Mark also has his back because they're in the same type of business of a job. So yeah. I'm like, again, we don't know who are close. We're just seeing who are not getting on with each other. But again, I think Therese is probably the most um, on the ball with Chloe. But then you've got Justine, who's in the background, who is friends with Claire. And she's kind of giving her a head up, which for me is good because I do like Claire. But for the tracer, if for the faithful, you don't want to get into the final and possibly winning all that money because then you'll feel like probably not what to be friends with. I know, yeah, and I, I, I suppose they're all they're they're all playing this game for the first time, but so it's Definitely. easy for us to say. But you really, and it, I think the one thing Chloe is right about is. You can't trust anyone, especially not this early on. They can't. They, they. It's probably not a good idea to make friends with people and then tell them everything that other people are saying about them because you have no idea who the traitors are. So you, you really do have to play the game with at this level of mistrust of everybody, even if you think you get on with them. And so... this is the thing. This was the, sorry for cutting you off there. Sorry. Oh, on you go. This was the first English show. US and UK happens way after. So this is literally, they don't have a clue on anything about this game. Yeah, yeah. So I do, in a way, you have got a point about Chloe, and I will give her that in a way. She's quite on there. One final thing I noticed here is something that I really like, and I mentioned this in episode one of the podcast for this season. I like that quite a decent chunk of the episode is devoted to just two discussions. So it's quite... I like that. I like to hear all the what everybody's talking about, and I like to see all the interactions. So I like that we get a good ten minutes or so here of just people talking about who they think the traitors are, rather than ninety percent of the episode being the mission and then everything else being quick, yeah, tiny chat. So, I, although we've mentioned a few things about editing that are quite strange, 
I like that there's so much time given to just watching everybody talk amongst yeah. themselves. So we're in the banishment room for this episode and Roger teases them a little bit about the fact that they completely failed the mission. And he reminds them that in the last banishment, they sent home Jack. So it's not like a great happy mood to start off tonight. Um, Nigel begins the discussions then and he starts straight away by focusing on MK. He tells MK that he's been acting suspiciously with his speeches and that it's really making people suspect him. And then MK tries to defend himself and he, say, he says that he, he gets nervous sometimes. And then he starts rambling again about how he just wants to assist the faithfuls and he just wants to find the traitors. And he's, he asks them, don't vote me out but just because you don't like me. Uh, that... I, I just find it all quite strange because he's obviously really successful in his professional life. You'd kind of think that he'd be used to dealing with pressured situations and that he would understand as a criminal defence lawyer that talking so much probably makes you look quite guilty. So I, I just, yeah, I don't. I don't know why he behaves the way that he does, not realising how it makes him come across to people. Um, so after this, they then ask him, well, who do you think is the traitor then? Or as one of the traitors? And he suggests that he thinks Claire could be a traitor. And Mark and Teresa, we know this from earlier, that Mark and Teresa kind of agree with that. And they also have suspicions of Claire. And they bring up this the same thing that that her body language on that first night when she when the traitors were chosen suggested that she felt really uncomfortable and nervous, um, and so Claire's got no option at this point but to defend herself. So she says, "Look, I was just freaked out about the fact that somebody was going to be murdered that first night." She says, "I didn't realize that it would be so quick, so that's why I was looking so nervous." So I, I mean that's quite a good excuse I think like that's a good way of explaining it so and they they seem to believe it they, they kind of seem to back off her at that point um Kate then asks Chloe what she thinks so this is where we get to this like the brilliant part of this whole episode Kate says Chloe what do you think Chloe just says she doesn't want to share anything and Fee presses her a little bit and says well why not Chloe says I just don't want to speak. Like, and it, it, I just, what do you, what do you think? What do you think about this, Joseph? Oh, like she was the big I am in the yoke, and I am coming up. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you it all. And it was like, as soon as it got to that bit, you could feel again with the music and the edit when I watched it the first time, and even this time, you, you knew something was off because she went in quite. I don't know, very, because it always pans where you're sitting there with everybody else is speaking, and it's like she looks hostile, and it's either like she's going to be big explosive or just not talking. A bit like what MK does in his job with his people, probably don't talk. Yeah. Um, it was interesting, this whole banishment, because MK is doing that, and it's like two little two ways. Yeah. And you'd think he'd observe more, like just stands in the back and watch, and then judge. Clear. Again, I felt very sorry for her, but in a way, the heat is off that. I love the team, the tins of beans comment she said, which went the tins of beans got over there. <laughs> like, I've never heard that expression before. I loved it. And then obviously, Fee then got on to Chloe, and then Kate kind of then ramped her up. So it was like, Chloe has to talk. And then when she says she doesn't want to, I will get onto this in a bit, but I do have a theory now, and I didn't think it in the first time, even though I discussed it with other people with who I was watching it with but I, I did look into it and I was reading more of between the lines but I'll get into that in a bit but yeah I just thought she was dead cold like she yeah. wasn't very warm and aren't spiritual people meant to be some of the most warmest people on the planet <laughs> yeah it's very strange behaviour on one hand it, it is like you, you mentioned um, something about you know MK he it it makes me think of people who've been accused of a crime who say I don't want to say anything without my lawyer present. It was giving me very much that energy. Yeah. <laughs> but but then that makes her look really guilty, like she's got something to hide. 
but also it also came across as like a little bit childish like a kid yeah. being in a bad mood and just saying i'm not playing and you just think <laughs> it, it, chloe this is a game you know like we are the point of coming to this room is that everyone talks about who they think the traitors could be so to just say i just don't want to speak i think i'll get and get a grip like who you know it, we're this is a game show. It's not that serious. <laughs> so I, I, it's very, I would find it very frustrating if I was sitting around that table yeah. with her, I think. So the voting begins and it's pretty overwhelming. We end up with MK has 16 votes out of everybody. Chloe gets two, probably because of the weird way that she's behaving. Olivia gets one and Claire gets one. So it's very obvious who's going to go. Um, and we're not finished with everybody yet, but it gets to Chloe. She's not actually cast her vote yet. And Chloe uh, simply says, Kashindi, Marielle, Angus, Teresa are the traitors. And there's this shot of Angus, one of these classic shots of Angus just putting on the most uh, uncomfortable, like if you looked up the word guilty in the dictionary, they should just have a picture of Angus's face. Um, and then Chloe reveals her vote. She's voted for Teresa and then asks to leave the room. And she gets up and goes before Roger can even really talk to her about it or or really ask her anything. And then Fee, the voice of the voice of everyone, Fee just says, Are you leaving the game or the room? And Chloe just ignores it, walks out. And the game kind of continues, like they just keep going. We go back to the result, and of course it, it's it's overwhelming. MK is clearly voted out. He stands up, and he says, "The traitors are still amongst you. I am a faithful." There's again fee. Fee then just goes, "What is going on?" I just want Fee to narrate the whole series going forward. Yeah. I just think she's so funny. <laughs> so they've done it again. If predictably they've got rid of another faithful they haven't caught a traitor this tends to be the pattern and the traitors in the different countries it takes a while to find the traitor so MK's gone and for the last part of the episode we go to what I'm calling the traitor's den because I can't really call it traitor's tower anymore because it's not really a tower is it so well, like a hallway. <laughs> yeah it's this sort of like plush just sort of, there's some couches and some nice ornaments in the background. It's actually a very nice room, Mel. I, I quite like it. So, the traitor's den. Um, and, and well, before we even get there, we've got these, they have these amazing shots of the traitors, like, roaming through the house at night. It's it's quite oh. creepy, actually. I think it's, like, oh. it's so over the top and ridiculous, but it's, it's quite effective. I, I like it. Um, the traitors seem quite rattled, but... They also agree that Chloe's revelation, Chloe's four names, probably won't really harm them because they think, well, Chloe's going to sit and get herself banished now. Like, she's just made herself a big target. So we kind of probably don't really need to worry about her. And they don't think anyone takes her that seriously anyway. So they start to talk about murder for tonight, who they're going to murder. They want to break up this alliance between Ethan, Fee, and Teresa. Um, they say that Fee is really sociable and likeable and they think that if they murder her that would cause a bit of confusion and they think that it's good to cause confusion. Um, or Ethan is their other option and they think that actually he's quite, he's probably quite a good undercover game player that actually is probably quite competitive and like Sandra in the last episode they don't want people like that. They don't want really good game players who are smart and going to really try and figure things out. Uh, what do you what do you think of this? Their theory is they don't like alliances. They don't like Ethan, Fee, and Teresa being a little group, so they want to break that up. Do you think that's a good tactic for the traitors? Is that what they should be doing? Well, for them, it is. But I don't know whether you agree. But I didn't feel Ethan's presence once in this episode, other than the breakfast table. No. So when they were saying it, and I'll go back to the management in a minute because I do have a lot of thoughts on what they were saying about Chloe. But with Ethan and here, again, is the stuff we're not being shown in this edit? Because to me, Ethan didn't come across once other than that time. And I'm like, but he's not a threat to me. Because unlike 
Sandra in the last one, she was a presence constantly in the edit. Yeah. He never got one talking headshot in that episode once. Except yeah. for when Fee mentions him. And I'm like, it's hard when you're watching it and you're thinking it's like a jigsaw. But I suppose they're there, so I can't imagine they lie about it. But I mean, I know they have to lie about their identities, but it just it was just strange and it it was just really interesting but yeah i think ethan was probably but then i don't know i think he would be a good one to get rid of because you see much was like that management table yeah so it's it's a very again what we're not seeing which i'm guessing is more the answer we didn't see much of ethan um which again that's why you said earlier you see a lot of them talking gives people like craig and alex got a few talking heads we don't see them either so that's why i think when you said that before about you like how you see them all interacting. It gives people who aren't even getting really a fair shake on the editing system. Yeah, um, I, I agree that, I mean, this is the second time really, I, I watched The Traitors Australia months ago all the way through, <laughs> and now I'm re-watching it. And I would have kind of almost forgotten who Ethan was if you had, yeah. you know, when I looked at the list of all the cast, I wouldn't have remembered him because you, you're right, he... He just is a victim of the editing process that he just doesn't really get any screen time. And I understand, you know, there's 24, 25 of them. They they, they can't all really be featured in every episode. And by episode two, he just hasn't had, had any screen mm-hmm. time. So, And then when I think of the whole banishment, like the Chloe thing, do you want to wear my theories on this Chloe thing? Okay, go for it. Thingy. So I think with Chloe, and I didn't agree with it at first, but I'm going to say this allegedly because I will have to say allegedly, I think she was planted in. <gasps> She's a plant. Now, when Roger was going to, when she was about to leave, he says, are you feeling comfortable? Yeah. Which then in my head was making me think, the sort of, did either someone have said something to Chloe that we are not privy to that has made her uncomfortable? Because... Even though, like you say, she was, I just think, wound up by it in that chair. There was a part of me that was thinking, well, let's play devil's advocate. Could she have been uncomfortable because something's been said that maybe she doesn't agree with? And when Roger said, are you feeling comfortable with them words? I was like, yeah, there's something deeper than what we're now in here. Because when they were in the room, they were assuming Chloe was in the game. Yeah. They were like, she's going to get banished. She shot herself in the foot. So I did my two vibes. Either something's happened in that edit that we're not privy to, which, again, don't want to spoil anything, but this whole show feels massively what if. Um, and then I also think something like that's happened where something's happened in the edit in that yoga room because there was a pause. And I did think there's something said there that we're not privy to. Yeah. Or she's put in by production. And I don't know why I'm leaning to the production more, but I think the whole way she thought of the train tracks, the comfortableness, it felt like, because as far as I'm aware, like with the UK one, I don't want to go too off topic, so to pull me on to. Um, we're thinking in the UK one, Aaron went out because he had autism. As far as I'm aware, she doesn't have any of that. And I also don't think a post. I thought he was a bit familiar in a way, like he was looking out for her in a way, like mm. that was a care. And he was like, are you sure you want to go? Are you feeling comfortable? And I was like, is something going on? Again, am I reading too much into it? Or is there some maybe legitimacy? Because it almost felt like no one knew what was going on when Fee went, are you coming back? And then they're saying she's out tomorrow. So was there something that we're missing massively in the Saturday? Yeah, you've... You've mentioned a couple of things that I thought of too. I assumed when I watched this for the first time and when I watched it again, actually, because I'd forgotten some things, when she got up and left the room, I just assumed it was implied, oh, she's le- she's left the game. She's she's gone. She doesn't want to be here anymore. But yeah, and then when the traitors meet at, at night, they talk as if Chloe's still in the game and they say, oh, oh she'll get herself banished. And I thought, oh, so they think she's still here. I I thought she was just already gone. So that was 
unusual. But then, uh, but then maybe behind the scenes, in between takes, maybe producer said, "Look, look, she's not gone. She's not gone. We're we're going to talk to her. Well, 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 she's still here. We'll talk her around." So maybe they just thought, "All right, okay, she's not gone yet." Um, my, my, I have a different theory about Chloe. Um, it's not particularly a conspiracy theory or anything like that. It's just, <laughs> it's just a theory about maybe why she left. I think she was maybe embarrassed that she was proving herself not to be a very good clairvoyant. So, so in the first episode, she had said, you know, my spirit advisors have spoken to me and told me to vote out Jack. And then Jack wasn't a traitor. And then she at the train station said, oh, I've had a vision. We're going to win the 24K. And then they didn't win it. So I think she was starting to say things on camera that weren't coming true and was possibly starting to think, oh, I'm making myself look like an idiot. And this is how I make a living. I'm going to be on TV saying all these, giving all these psychic predictions that aren't coming true. Is this really damaging for me? So I just wonder if she thought... This is not good for my brand. Like this is not good for me as a a clairvoyant who makes money out of this. So she just thought, Do you know what? I'll say my piece. Here's who I think the four traitors are, but I might be wrong. So I'm just gonna go. So I, I wonder if it was just that that she just thought I'm making myself look bad here. And you just literally when you said because she said the four of them I know are. That was part of why I thought she was a plan because I thought they don't know how many traces there is. Oh, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, three. Why was she so convinced there was four? Yeah, that I I hadn't even thought about that. You're right that she seemed to know there were four, or just guessed that there were four. But that is interesting. And funnily enough, mm-hmm. in a future episode, something like this comes up again where. A traitor, no spoilers, but a traitor yeah. accidentally lets slip that there are four traitors and other contestants go, how did you know there were four? So this is something that happens again in the series later. So for episode two, we basically end with the traitors deciding who they're going to murder and it's either going to be the or Ethan. So overall then, episode two of The Traitors Australia. Uh, Joseph, did you think this was a good episode? Fantastic. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was one of the best second episodes. Usually it's just getting to know everyone and slowly and boringly getting the story arcs, whereas this was just out the window. Let's all just go on at each other and I'm like, yeah, this is what this game is. Yes. Uh, How do you think The Traitors are doing so far? Brilliantly, I'd be dead. I mean, I know Claire and that have nearly given themselves away. Again, very lucky because of the MK thing, kind of. I do think if he hadn't have said that, I think she would be chopped in episode two. Um, and you can almost see the nerves in some of them when they're on that that porch thing with the mask on it, and you take them off, and you can see it's still there of that video. Um, but yeah, I think the traits are zooming brilliantly, and I love the ending where it's all very midsummer maids and it's clean. I think the production level is way better than the other two, in my opinion. This makes it more creepy. And I can now ask you, because just today, the Traitors Australia released, well, I say today, today our time, maybe it was yesterday Australia time, because they're a bit ahead of us. The There's been a sort of promotional image released um, of C- the Series 2 cast of the Traitors. And we already knew this, but there are they're using a lot of kind of reality stars and sort of D-list celebrities. Um so what do you what do you think of that for series two that they're that they're using they're doing what the US did and they're having some well known faces? What are your thoughts? I think I know what you're gonna say, but what are your thoughts? I don't <laughs> because it's you know what, if the D list in the sense of like say a UK Big Brother contestants here who was just doing an everyday job but they've been on a tally, that is different. But my guess is they're gonna be quite well off anyway. And it's like, it takes the essence from people that need it. And I think with Australia, they should have just gave this show one more chance of this way. And then if it didn't work, do that. 
if you go on Instagram and if you look at the Traitors Australia official page, they've released this image. Um, I just I just saw it this morning, and I don't recognise any of the celebrities. I don't know any of them because they're all Australian people oh, really? from Australian reality shows and things. But there's some of them are actors, and one of the what I already have discovered is one of them is an actor who has worked with Roger before, and Roger's coming back as the host for season two. So he knows one of the contestants. They worked on a TV program called Underbelly together. So there's going to be a strange kind of maybe conflict of interest there that Roger knows one of them. So I'm curious to see how that will work out. So uh, before we, we finish our game and we've been trying to play a game throughout this episode um joseph can you tell us a bit about where people can find you online what kind of things you do so yeah i'm i'm active on youtube and discord i mod the game called pro wrestling sim and i am thinking of doing other simulation fucking games but at the minute that's the one i've been doing it for two years and my YouTube is basically just how to's, but talk about other stuff as well. So, yeah, they are. Um, let me just link stuff because I've never seen the Discord one. Um, the Discord one, if you want to follow me, it's Ace Eleven Ninety Three, and my YouTube is. Um, I think it's, I think it's Ace or Tissueism, so it's one or the other. Um, but if you put Playboy in, it might find it there. So they usually the link. So yeah, if you want to follow, follow, and I'll happily speak. Instagram is just Fusher ninety three and Twitter is Pray Boy. So if you want to follow me on any of them, feel free. Great. And I I ask people this sometimes, and I'm going to ask you because you know a lot about pop culture and TV and music. Is that do you have any recommendations? Is there anything that you are watching or have watched recently that you think maybe Traitors fans will like? So um, it's called Oshinoko, and it is an anime. I feel like this podcast has a lot of anime recommendations. <laughs> but yeah, it's basically about an idol that gets murdered and it's all very mystery. Um, but yeah, it's a very good anime and it is available, I believe. Well, it is available on High Dive, so it is a service, but it is a good show and that is one I'd recommend for me. Okay, excellent. Sounds good. Now, we've been playing our game, The Trader Traitor. <laughs> I, at some point in our discussion, told you a lie, Joseph, I must confess. <laughs> um, I don't know, did you tell me a lie? Yes, I did. Oh, you did? Okay. I I have no idea what you lied about, so I'm really going to have to think about this. Um, do you have, to give me a bit more time, do you have any guesses what I lied to you about? Did you lie about... Um... The 16 second edit on the yoga bit? No, that is actually true. I timed it oh. and it was 16 seconds of pure silence of just Chloe staring at everyone. So that that actually was not a lie, that yes. was true. No, well, what, well, what was yours? How, oh, well, my lie was connected to Chloe, though, I have to say. I lied when I said that she was doing psychic readings on TikTok. Uh, I totally oh. made that up. I mean, she may well be, but I probably not. Okay. I completely well, invented I don't that. I don't use on Instagram anymore because the link doesn't exist when you look. It's took down, so I wonder if she's off. So she was put belt on you. <laughs> um, but you can't convince me of. <laughs> <laughs> your your lie. Um, I honestly, Unless it's that you just invented that anime program that you told me about and that that's not real. There's an anime program. <laughs> it's one of the biggest animes gathered at the moment. My lie was I said I was going to it now. Oh, the you did journey, that. I am crap. <laughs> Do you know, and, and and I even I remember you saying it, and I thought, oh, okay, that's that's really interesting. That's good to know, right? That might be useful. Okay, so you totally lied about that. Yeah, well, because I've been panicking with them. You were you were a very good liar then. You you betrayed me. You were a good traitor. I did not pick up on that at all. Well done. Thank so, you. 
Joseph, I thank you so much for talking to me today about the Traitors Australia. It's always great to have you on because you know so much about okay. it. So you've got plenty that we can talk about. Um, will you come back again for a future episode? Yeah, I'll be gagging to want to come back actually. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, but now, yeah, definitely. Brilliant. That's good to hear. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I will put all the links to everything that you mentioned in the show description notes. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hello, listeners. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Trader. And thanks again to my co-host, Joseph. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. You can keep up with the podcast on social media. We're on Twitter at The Trader Pod. Instagram at the Tradar Podcast, or you can email the Tradar Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. I'll be back with episode three very, very soon with a new guest co host who has never been on the podcast before, but is a big Traitors fan. And I know we're going to have a great discussion about the next episode. Until then, stay faithful. <laughs>